PSA for today, please don't be a lazy reader. Welcome to The Book Isn't Necessarily Better, a library podcast presented by the Community Library Network. My name is Roxanne and my co-host is Michaela. Our podcast is about comparing books and the adaptations that have been made for them, whether it's movies, graphic novels, operas, or ballets. All right, Michaela, why don't you start us off? What are we talking about today? Well, today we're going to talk about my favorite author of all time, Margaret Atwood. We're specifically going to talk about The Handmaid's Tale, but first I'm going to uh, jaw for a little while about Margaret herself. She's a, she's a Canadian novelist. You've probably heard me call her in past episodes Peggy, as she's affectionately known by people who know her, and I'd like to pretend that I'm one of those people. Okay. Uh, she's a Canadian novelist, born in 1939. She's like 81 this year. Go Peggy. Go Peggy. Her works talk a lot about identity and language and power politics, gender, religion, and mythology. She's written a lot of books that you would probably recognize from other things. We've mentioned her before uh, when we talked about the Odyssey. She wrote the Penelope Ad, which is a retelling of the Odyssey from Penelope's point of view. She wrote a book called Hegseed, which is a reimagining of Shakespeare's The Tempest. Oh, yeah. You watched Alias Grace, didn't you? I love Alias Grace. And I've I've read it. I've watched it many times. Okay. And you love both. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's one of my least favorite of hers, actually. But Shocker. Yeah, I know. Different opinions. (laughs) But not terrible. Also, she made a children's book called Wandering Wenda, which became a TV show. And then she was in all of the episodes, like wearing funny hats. That's cute. That's pretty cute. She's a she's a pretty cute lady, but also like pretty salty and pretty sharp. Um, I have a great quote to go along with that. Yeah. Somebody was asking her about writing The Handmaid's Tale and how maybe sort of only a dark person could come up with all these things. Mm-hmm. And her quote is, you know, you can't make it up. I mean, if you did make it up, people would think, what a twisted dark person you are. Whereas I'm a cheerful, happy person. <laughs> But it's all there, you know, it all happened one way or another. Mm -hmm. And she says that about most of the things she writes is that the elements of her books come from one thing or another that has happened or is trending towards happening already. I like that. Yeah, we'll talk about that probably quite a bit when we get into the actual story. Just a little bit more about her life. She was uh, in a very long relationship with another novelist named Graham Gibson. He died in 2019, so uh, of dementia. She also put out a book of poetry last year called Dearly. A lot of that is about her experience um, dealing with his dementia and then the loss um, afterwards. And it's a very, very great volume of poetry. So has she recommended. Has she written other nonfiction before? I think she's written several nonfiction I have not read many of them. Most of her thing, most of her writing is what she calls speculative fiction. So taking pieces of history and turning them into, it's kind of like um, historical fiction almost, where you spin out someone's life in, a, in an imaginary sort of way. She takes those same elements of history and spins them into uh, sort of dystopian horror scapes, which <laughs> um, is kind of terrifying, but also feels very real while you're reading them. In fact, uh, The Handmaid's Tale, which is a very dystopian work, was the most widely read book of 2017. Interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. I just had a thought. Yeah. I think that Margaret Atwood would be really good at designing those Halloween, like, horror corn mazes. (laughs) You know, where you can go to Silverwood, the local amusement park, and they they turn it into basically Mm -hmm. a haunted house. I think she would do an amazing psychological thriller. Oh, she'd be so good at that. There'd be just like really quiet things stalking you in the background, but you would never see anything. And you're at like the DMV or something. Yes. Yeah. You'd have a horrible existential crisis (laughs) in the middle of a corn maze. Yeah. Or like you're crying in a McDonald's parking lot or something. (laughs) I love it. She came up with this idea called the long pen. And this is like several years ago before this was really a reality. Now this is not going to sound that crazy, but she came up with this thing called the long pen, which would be a thing that allows you to write in real ink 
remotely somewhere else in the world. She came up with this while she was on tour for my favorite book of hers, Oryx and Crate, and was like, why do I have to tour? Why can't I just like sign your book in Brazil from my house in Canada? So she actually founded a company to create this technology. Wow. Yeah. And of course it hasn't exactly come to fruition. That's not really a thing yet, but they do now offer cloud-based electronic signature technology. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Just just a very weird thing. She's a lifelong bird watcher. I think I mentioned to Roxanne earlier, she and Graham were uh, members of the Rare Bird Club within BirdLife International and actually were joint honorary presidents of that club. Hashtag that bird life. Mm-hmm. Her graphic novel series, Angel Catbird, also, which is great, by the way, he's half human, half cat, and half bird. <laughs> and uh, the whole graphic novel series is about like wildlife preservation and uh, spaying and neutering your cats so that you don't decimate wild bird populations. Okay, it's it's pretty fascinating. It's not really about that. Like it's a it's like a superhero comic, but it's got little. Uh, just so you know, cats devastate forest life and uh, ecosystems, and you should definitely take care of them and not let them run wild. Like interspersed. Wow. Yeah. And I should mention that even though she doesn't identify as a sci-fi writer, um, she calls it books, you know, where squids talk in space. And she's kind of, (laughs) she's kind of actually very uh, dismissive of sci-fi in a way, which is kind of odd Hmm. because she won the first ever Arthur C. Clarke Award, which is specifically for science fiction. I think that shows like what a badass she is. Uh, Yeah. She's absolutely the coolest person of all time. And the definition of being cool is seemingly not to care. Oh yeah. She does not care about anything. I wonder what that is like. That sounds (laughs) nice. I aspire to be as cool as I So let's, let's talk about the book that we're focusing on today. The Handmaid's Tale. When did it come out? Came out in 1985. So there probably will be some spoilers for the book, just a heads up. It's, again, a work of dystopian or speculative fiction, which is the kind of fiction that is not about talking squids and (laughs) Martians. It's all based on things that she says have happened in history. So it's based in a what's called a theonomic state called Gilead. Uh, Gilead is like a pseudo-religious organization that has overthrown the United States government and established like an old-timey biblical rule. Women are very subjugated in the society. There are these women known as handmaids who are forced to bear children for the like high-ranking officials. And this is all based on, A, there's an infertility plague going around. So many women are unable to conceive. Many men are unable to conceive. There are, the birth rates have declined significantly. So Gilead is ruled by the sons of Jacob. They're based on the biblical story of Jacob and Leah, Leah couldn't have kids, so she told him to take her handmaid and have kids and that they would be her kids by her husband. So it's this, again, a nightmare sort of scenario where some of them are in thrall to the high-ranking officials, literally just there to bear their children. That is their only function. They're essentially <clears throat> slaves. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, isn't it that if you do have a working reproductive system as a woman, that is going to be your job? Yes, it's and it's specifically any women who have proven their reproductive efficiency and have committed crimes against the state of Gilead, including crimes in the past. So our main character, Avfred, and that's a patronymic, she's her name is really June, but it's been taken away. Her name is of Fred, which is her commander's name. And in the book it's actually Never said that her name is June. That's correct. Yeah, it comes up actually in the show. And I think it's suggested in the book and it's suggested in the Testaments. Yeah, I actually have a quote from Atwood about this. Mm -hmm. So she says, Why do we never learn the real name of the central character? I've often been asked. Because, I reply, so many people throughout history have had their names changed or have simply disappeared from view. Some have deduced that Offred's real name is June, since of all the names whispered among the handmaids in the gymnasium dormitory, June is the only one that never appears again. That was not my original thought, but it fits, so readers are welcome to it if they wish. Okay, I learned something new, and I love this book, so that's actually a really great thing to find out. It's her third posting in the book, so if you are unable to reproduce for these people, 
after two years, they send you to a new home to bear children for a new commander. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty brutal. There's a whole ceremony that you have to go through in order to reproduce. You can probably imagine what that is like, except there's the creepy uh, element of the commander's wife also being in the room because the biblical story says she shall bear upon my knees. Mm. Mm. And when handmaids get pregnant and do actually give birth to the children, they also give birth while sitting on the, the wives' knees. So it's ultra creepy, this whole story. I think where I was going before was that women who have committed some sort of infraction are the only ones who are, who are forced into this. So okay. of Fred, in the past, was married to a man who got divorced from his first wife. Well, the sons of Jacob don't recognize divorce because it's against their biblical principles. So she is considered technically unmarried to a man she was having an affair with. So that is why she is now a handmaid, because she's, you know, committed some sins in the past. So in the past, was she actually married, or they just don't recognize the marriage because it was a second marriage? She was actually married to him, but they don't recognize it because it's his second marriage, and they don't recognize his first divorce. I see. Yes. So she is considered almost like a mistress, to him. Mm. So Offred has gone through a lot at what they call the Rachel and Leah Center. That's where they re-educate these women on kind of how their lives are going to be. They're educated by these aunts, right, who are older women who are unable to bear children anymore but still need some sort of position in society. So they're like this weird new intermediate ruling class that's kind of a go-between between like the, the higher up ranking men and the lower ranking women. None of the women are allowed to read anymore. They're pretty much expected to stay inside, maybe go outside and garden a little bit. Um, none of their lives are very good. Is anyone allowed to read? The men are allowed to read. The high-ranking men. In fact, uh, Commander Waterford, June's, sorry, Alfred's commander, has an entire library. And he invites her in there um, under the radar and lets her read sometimes. And it's a, it's a very big deal. So some of the things that this is actually based on, uh, according to Margaret Atwood, she takes some theonomic themes from 80s religious right. So the moral majority focus on the family, Christian coalition, and the Reagan administration have all been kind of pointed to as the basis for the religious aspects in this book. Also the Islamic revolution in Iran that happened in 17, or, uh, 1978 and 79. It's really interesting you say that. I was just camping this weekend. Mm -hmm. And um, the other couple we were camping with, my new friend I met, she was telling me, she her parents are both from Iran, mm -hmm. that she met Margaret Atwood before the movie came out. And she got to ask the question uh, specifically about how much of this was taken from the Iranian Revolution. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and so hmm, that was a cool tie-in. Yeah, very cool. She also took the commanders from, like, some Canadian politicians, uh, unnamed Canadian politicians, but I believe... <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah, I believe she lives in Toronto, so, like, her local I th officials. So, full disclosure, I lived in Canada for five years <laughs> <laughs> in Vancouver. I think she is referring to a lady called Kim Norton, mm who was a, a really big proponent of sort of back to family values in the 80s, 90s. Interesting. That's who I'm guessing she's referring to. Okay. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. It's And she was the, the prime minister. Okay. That makes total sense. She kind of plays coy about it. Yeah. I, I would guess that Canadians would pretty, pretty, would pretty much know exactly who she's talking about. That's funny. But it is set in the US. It's not set in Canada. I think that's because she thought that the U.S. was much more likely to go down this path than Canada. Yeah, she basically said there's such a diversity of opinion in Canada. And that also makes sense. They don't have just two parties oh, and yeah. they have runoff elections. So it's not as polarized in their politics. Interesting. She's a, a World War II. Well, she was born in 1939. So she lived through World War II, but mostly experienced the after effects of World War II. So some of the women like losing their jobs and having to rely on the, the men entirely came from when the, the men came back from World War II and asked for the jobs back and the women just kind of had to leave their jobs all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. That's where some of that comes from. Offred works in a, I think she's a book editor. In, in the, the show, she is a book editor. So I think that's what she is in the book too. And um, yeah, she is one day they come in with armed guards and tell them they all have to go home and not come back to work ever again. Yeah, and also it was crazy cutting off their money by just freezing their bank accounts. Yeah, and this I find really interesting because she's writing this in the in the 80s. 
right? So it's a little bit ahead of its time in that she imagines a day when hardly anyone will have cash. They all use cards to pay for everything. And Mm -hmm. that is why they're able to take over is because you can just turn off the internet and nobody has, or turn off, you know, all of the, the F accounts at the bank and suddenly they can't touch their money anymore. And nobody has cash saved up, so nobody can get away. Yeah, it, it's pretty genius. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was reading an interview with Margaret Atwood, and she was saying, oh, people want to go to a... Compl- like, she goes on kind of a little bit of a rant. Mm-hmm. She's like, people want to go to a place where we don't have cash anymore, but we simply must have cash. <laughs> we have to have cash money for situations like this. I have a feeling that... When she dies, and I don't ever want that to happen. There's going to be money There will be like an entire mattress stuffed full of cash in her house. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't surprise me a bit. Full of loonies and toonies, which are their (laughs) one and two dollar coins. Yeah. Uh, So they'll be super heavy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like, man, she had a thick mattress. Yeah. This book is the one that I said won that Arthur C. Clarke Award, which, again, is only for sci-fi. She won it, the first one they ever did, and has ever since been really dismissive of (laughs) sci-fi. And a lot of people in the sci-fi community are very upset with her. She was also nominated for a Nebula Award and a Booker Prize and a Prometheus Award. Both the Prometheus and the Nebula are also for sci-fi. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. The Booker Prize she later won for the follow-up to this novel, which is called The Testaments. And it came out just recently. Right. A couple years ago. So this is... I've told Roxanne this several times. I love this book. I read it in high school and absolutely fell in love with it. It's a it's what they call an instant classic. So it's been basically a classic since it came out in the 80s. So when I read it in high school, I am a lazy reader. I'll admit that to you right now. I don't usually read the forewords and the introductions and the afterwards. Well, guess what, you guys? You have to read the afterword to this book because it's not actually an afterword. It's a it's a fake conference proceeding where they later unearth like the remains of Gilead and try to describe what went wrong in this society. And they have found Offred's tapes that she made of like her experience during this and are like, I wonder who this woman was and if she ever got out. And uh, because at the end of the book, you don't know if she's going to die or escape to Canada. Those are kind of her two choices. And it's ambiguous, totally ambiguous. And then you find out that she at least made it somewhere else because she recorded tapes and they later found them and are digesting them for like this academic seminar. I didn't find this out until after I had already read The Testaments, (laughs) which which is the follow-up book to this, where it spoils everything. Like you find out that she is alive. And I was like, oh my God, she's alive. And everyone around me was like, yeah, obviously. And I was listening to the audiobook of The Handmaid's Tale, like a week later. And I was like five minutes away from home when it ended. And I was like, you know what? Fine. I'll listen to the afterward because I'm only five minutes from home. (laughs) (laughs) How'd that go for you? Um, I found out a lot of new stuff. Yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah, I did. (laughs) This also happened with Lolita, didn't it? It did also happen with Lolita. So with Lolita, you have to read the foreword. You find out what happens to every single character in the novel. Yeah. I didn't find that out till like the third time I read it. So you already know that Humbert's (laughs) killed himself, that, you know, everything has happened. Yeah, I got to the end of that book and it was a huge shock to me. (laughs) So PSA for today, please don't be a lazy reader like me. So <laughs> what else happens in the book? What else happens? Is it her resisting? Is... Oh, yeah. So it's it's a really interior book. It's mostly about her thoughts as she goes through this process of... She doesn't want to be here. Most of the women don't want to be here, but they've they've really tightened the noose around everyone, and it's very hard to escape this. So most of the book is her navigating the couple of relationships that she is able to have, So her partner, her walking partner, another handmaid, is named Ofglen. She finds out that she is part of an underground resistance and that there is a spy working in her household and this whole Mayday operation exists. Mayday is what they they call it. They use it as as a password. Mayday comes from the French word for help me. Oh. So they're walking along one day and everything is like very fraught. Like you cannot have open conversations. They're walking along one day and of Glenn says, it's a beautiful May day, isn't it? And June of Fred goes, oh yes, yes it is. Later she finds out that 
her partner was testing her to see if she knew about the resistance. Oh, I see. Yeah. And if they could be part of it. They do it in the show as well. So there's only one month of the year where she can do that? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. So she finds out there's this resistance. She also has a complicated relationship with the wife in the house that she's staying in. Obviously, the wife hates her. Her name is Serena Joy, right? Yeah, and she is a really interesting character because she's a former televangelist mm-hmm. who who was very famous for going around and making speeches about how women should stay in the house and how she was making this great sacrifice for everyone by being out here telling them um, because she wasn't able to fulfill her wifely role of living in the house because she had to tell everybody else to get back in the house. She sounds uh, very much like a politician whose name is Phil Shafley. Have you heard of her? Mm -mm. Um, Phil Shafley was an ultra conservative politician in the 19... Actually, she started in the 1960s and she worked until I think her death in the 90s. (laughs) Um, Her entire thing was, um, you know, I'm making a sacrifice by being out here and being a politician, but we need to stop the Equal Rights Amendment. Women need to be back in the home. Let's get back to family values. Which is very oh, ironic exactly. because she is out there, you know, being a politician, but she always did it under the flag of, you know, I'm doing the sacrifice Beneficence. for you. Yeah. And they just came out with a show that where Kate Blanchett plays her. And I've watched it, it's really good. And Kate Blanchett is amazing. Oh. As her. But Phil Shafley uh is not one of my favorite uh historical <laughs> women that I studied about in women's history, but she is fascinating. Hmm. Apparently, I I would almost imagine that you said she's like part of family values. Yes, and she, so the Equal Rights Amendment was an amendment that's never been passed, and it came about in the 1960s, early 70s, um, and it basically was part of the culture wars between feminism and anti-feminism. Fascinating. Yeah, that sounds right up Margaret Atwood's yeah. alley. But it's never been passed, and a lot of that was because of Phyllis Shafley. I, you just blew my mind. I just, I'm going to have to Again, go and do so much more research. My women's history major, the money I spent on that is, you know, coming right? to fruition. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Margaret Atwood based a lot of Serena Joy on Phyllis Shafley. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like it's contemporary. Very similar. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Serena Joy hates of Fred for very obvious reasons. She's put her in a very awkward place and she has gotten her own like just desserts. She got exactly what she <laughs> was was angling for and now she hates it. So she desperately wants a child to come out of this. That's kind of like her only salvation, she thinks. So she is desperate for Alfred to get pregnant. She kind of asks her to... She borrows her yeah, out. Yeah, she borrows her out to, <laughs> um, to their driver. So because she thinks her husband is sterile. So so she's trying to get her to have children by other means, which will elevate her status as a wife and kind of prove that she was right. Meanwhile, Uffred is also uh, having kind of an emotional affair with Nick as well. And the commander has asked to see her privately, which is a huge no-no. They're definitely not supposed to do that. He takes her to this government-sanctioned club called Jezebel's, which <laughs> there's a very obvious biblical reference there. Takes her to Jezebel's where unwomen, that's what they call women like of Fred, some of them who don't work out as handmaids because of their like temperaments work at Jezebel's basically as prostitutes. And she meets back up with her friend Moira, who she, she knew before, and she also knew at the Rachel and Leah Center, which they call the Red Center, and finds out a little bit more about the resistance and my, Moira's plans to get out and escape to Canada. There's an underground railroad that's run... Um, it's never really said, but it's run by the Quakers, basically, because Margaret Atwood thought, oh, if anyone was going to help these people, it would be the Quakers. They would have a, an underground passage through Pennsylvania up to Canada. That checks out. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All of this is interspersed with glimpses into the past of Alfred's life. So her life before with her husband, Luke, her daughter, Hannah, uh, her mom, who was, a, who was a feminist activist in the, in the 60s and 70s leading up to this. And basically, she doesn't really know anything about the resistance. She hasn't been, like, inducted into, like, the sacred halls of of secrecy or anything. But she knows enough about it to be dangerous. And at the end, you don't know if someone has sold her out or if someone is trying to help her escape on this underground railroad. They call it the underground female road. (laughs) Yeah, I know. But she has decided not to to kill herself like a previous handmaid did in her room. And it's a huge um, crisis for her. Hmm. Yeah. 
Do you want to transition to the show? Yeah. Do you want to talk? I think you watched it a little more recently. Do you want to? I did. So I was a, I'm a huge fan of The Handmaid's Tale. When it first came out in 2017, I did start watching it. But with everything that was going on in the world, I definitely needed more of an escape. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of dropped off from the show and probably went and watched like reruns of 30 Rock or something. <laughs> <laughs> Old Friends episodes. Yeah. But I... I I'm getting back into it. So I did rewatch the first couple of episodes, and it definitely... Um, oh, and it's put on by Hulu. Mm-hmm. And it definitely does seem to fit the book, at least in the beginning. But, I mean, isn't it sort of like Game of Thrones, where mm-hmm. they ran out of content, so they, they have to... Yeah, they kind Make of offshoot. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Margaret Atwood is a consultant. Do you know that she makes a cameo in the first episode? Yeah, I did rewatch just to see her. Um, it's pretty great. She slaps Elizabeth Moss, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah, she plays an aunt, and she um, they're trying to get everyone to shame this woman in the center talking about like a horrible trauma, and she won't do it, and so Margaret Atwood comes up and just smacks Elizabeth <laughs> Moss, who stars as Alfred. Yes. And Alexis Bledel as Upglen. Okay, were you a were you a Gilmore Girls fan? Yeah, I was, and actually, oh, okay. I have seen Alexis Bledel in a supermarket in Minneapolis. Oh, because, because her she's... husband, who played Pete Campbell, was in a play that summer. Mm. Oh, Pete Campbell from Mad Men. Oh, okay. Vincent Carthizer. <laughs> that's his name. Oh, okay, okay. And I, <laughs> I, I went up to her and I said, "I like your work," and then she stared at me. <laughs> and I've regretted it for the past eight years. <laughs> that's that's amazing. I've never actually watched Gilmore Girls. Um, I was more into the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I liked both. Yep. So there's a a really great cast in this show. You want to go through some of the some of the big names? Yeah. So there's Joseph Fiennes. He plays the commander. He has a full name in this. So his name is Frederick Waterford. Frederick Waterford. Yes. Uh, and it was really bothering me until I could not figure out who it was. Yeah, it's the guy who plays Shakespeare in Shakespeare in Love. Mm-hmm. So I had just seen him. We, My husband and I lovingly refer to him as the lesser finds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so mean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The woman who plays Rita, which is sort of like the grumpy Martha character. Yeah. Who, basically, like, she's the house maid. She, of all work. Yeah. She yeah. actually wrote her college entrance exam uh, essay on the book and it won her a scholarship to get into college oh wow and she focused on the character of rita oh how funny yeah and then later played her she's also a uh, pastor nita if you've watched kim's convenience no which, if you haven't is hilarious and you should probably watch it a canadian show uh, yes <clears throat> canadians make the best tv i've discovered they do and they have the best comedians like schitt's creek yeah, Schitt's Creek and, and Kim's Convenience are like two sides of the same coin. They're mm-hmm. both so funny. Uh, Yvonne Strahovski also in this. She plays Serena Joy. Who is she? It's driving me nuts. Okay, you. there's probably a lot of things you might recognize her from, but like not exactly. She, she has such a familiar face. She was in Chuck. Did you watch Chuck? No. Okay, Chuck was like her big show. You pro- you might recognize her. Does Ryan play a lot of video games? Eh, meh. Okay. Fair amount. We, we have a console. Oh, okay, okay. And she's in a lot of video games where they do the, the motion capture Yeah. Uh, for the characters. So it's like her face and her, her sure. voice and everything, but in like a cartoon form. Mm-hmm. So like what? Uh, like Mass Effect. We're sort of a Far Cry family. Mm, okay, okay. But I'm off topic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so this is uh, notable, the show, for being the first streaming show to win an Emmy for Outstanding Drama. Oh. I didn't know it was the first one. Mm-hmm. They've won a lot of primetime Emmys, actually, like eight of them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really well made. One thing I really like is that they make, re- because even though the book was written in the 80s, they make a lot of references, because it came out in 2017, as if this is happening now. Yes. So they're saying, I took an Uber here. I met a, my girlfriend on Tinder. Mm-hmm. They all have cell phones. Yeah. She meets her husband uh, when he's, she's trying to decide on a better photo for her dating app so yeah it's very much grounded in the the late 2010s Mm -hmm. and it looks cool as well it's the book is really color-coded everyone has clothes that match their status so the handmaids wear red which is a symbol of blood and fertility that's that's why they're there the marthas wear green the wives wear blue uh, the men have their own set of dress systems and the show does this like really well 
everything is like really like two toned. It's all really mm -hmm. black and white, like in the background, and then the people's costumes really pop because they're just colorful and. Uh, yeah, and it's gorgeous. And speaking mm -hmm. of the costumes, I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. I'm sure you are. <laughs> so they wear these sort of um, little, uh, like, very simple hair coverings. And then over them they have these big bonnets that, like, if you think of, like, old prairie. Um, Do you know where she took these from? Where? She, they're used Wait, to... were they nurses? No. Oh. There used to be this product uh, called Old Dutch Cleanser. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they still have that. Yeah, the yeah, little yeah. Dutch girl. So Margaret Atwood was super afraid of the <laughs> the emblem on that, the Dutch girl with the big... Yeah, like, so what we're talking about, it's like a bonnet that goes way past your face so that if you see somebody from the side, you can't see her face. And right. you pretty much are looking down a tunnel. Yeah. And so it's used to sort of cover your face from the sun. Mm -hmm. And maybe from honesty. Uh, for, from people as well. And mm -hmm. it makes it very hard to to talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. Because you'd have to turn your entire head, and so people would know you were talking. So their whole thing is they talk like very like under their breath or out of the side of their mouths mm -hmm. to to be able to say anything to anyone. It effectively hampers all like escape attempts. Yep, and the actors actually had a hard time seeing each other when they're wearing their wing mm -hmm. headdresses. So it actually helps them psychologically get into the roles mm -hmm. because they can only hear the other actors; they can't necessarily see them. Oh, that's really cool. Really interesting. Uh, if you also look at the um, sets, like you were saying, within the household, Serena Joy mm -hmm. has everything in her rooms are blue. Yep. And then um, Offred's room is like pretty stark and white, yeah. at like a like a sanatorium. Mm hmm. And it's it's literally a sanatorium because what happened was that their last handmaid hanged herself from the ceiling, so they've removed all of the fixtures. From the room. She has basically a bed and a pillow that says Faith that <laughs> Serena Joy hand embroidered. Um, Cat. Yeah. And a chair. And I think that's how the book They're also like a hashtag blessed. <laughs> I wish. No. This is this is before hashtags. Thank goodness. I don't um, know. They have Tinder. They, they do have Tinder. Oh, but they took all that stuff away. Yeah. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. How can I say Faith? She's not supposed to read. That they talk about that in the book. Oh. It's kind of like an ironic thing because all the women could read before. Yeah, they just they're just yeah. not allowed to now. Right. So there's a very weird dichotomy of like they know how to do things, but they're not allowed to do them. So they're all much more intelligent. The aunts keep telling them that like it'll be better for the next generation because they'll never have known anything different. But right. you guys are like making a huge sacrifice for the betterment of the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going back to um, the sets, mm -hmm. I found out that uh, a really cool touch that you probably would not have noticed unless you specifically knew this is that all of the art in the um, Waterford household mm -hmm. are pieces that now hang at the Boston Fine Art Museum. Oh. And so the idea is that they stole that art from the museum, oh. which is taken from something that Nazis did. Mm -hmm. They stole art from museums. And hung them up. So I love that touch that you have no idea. Right. Unless, but now that you're watching the show, you can look at it and see all these really famous paintings That's that I are supposed to be originals stolen from the museum. Like they just went in and took what they wanted. Hmm. I thought I recognized a couple of them. So that is really fascinating. And it also makes it sort of more real because if they, we already kind of knew this was supposed to take place in Boston based on some of the landmarks and things that they talk about. Yep. And that's why they choose yeah. art from the Boston Museum. Oh, that's cool. That's really, really interesting. Oh, uh, and then still talking about costumes, Elizabeth Moss doesn't actually wear any film makeup. Oh, right. This allows her acting to be more direct because there are so many major close-ups. Mm -hmm. And I and feel long. like that H HD film that you'd probably be able to see it. So I feel like it, it gives it more realism. Yeah. It does do a really good job of of like facial acting, it focuses for an uncomfortably long time on people's faces sometimes mm -hmm. where you can really see like their inner struggle to like remain calm on the surface, like playing out across their faces. And it, it's like painful to watch, which again is why this show is not really great. If you need like an escape show, don't watch this one. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't great for me. <laughs> right, right. But uh, I'm ready to try it again. Yeah, it's a great show. It just, you have to be in the right headspace for it, I feel like, because it's it's very intense. And that brings me to a bone that I have to pick with the show's Pick directors. that bone, girl. Pick it. Okay. 
at the end of season one, it ends similarly to the book. So the, the van comes for her. She doesn't know what her fate is going to be. Season two opens with this, like, scene that's supposed to be really harrowing. They're, they're maybe going to kill some of the handmaids. And it's supposed, it's like, got this, like, no talking and all the music is scary. And everyone is, like, screaming or crying or, or doing different things. They all think they're going to die. That scene has no teeth whatsoever because it's like the first 10 minutes of season two so you know that they're gonna live or at least some of them have to live oh so there's there's no even though it's supposed to be this really scary thing where you think a bunch of people are gonna have really horrible things happen to them you know nothing horrible is going to happen to them because it's the beginning of season two (laughs) why wouldn't you do it at the end of season one as a cliffhanger as a cliffhanger and have that be the last thing that you see it just i don't know girl I, I anyway, just don't know. I would like to complain to, <laughs> <laughs> to all of the showrunners for ruining what could have been a really interesting scene by putting it in the wrong place. Mm. Yeah. Oh, a big difference that I noticed is they made Serena Joy a lot younger. Much younger. And she doesn't have a cane. Oh, yeah. So in the book, she's in her 50s or 60s? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So past... Actual childbearing childbearing age. Um, In this, it's more clear that she's barren Mm -hmm. because of the like toxic atmosphere that they're in. Mm -hmm. Um, The chemicals and stuff. That's a literal thing that Margaret Atwood took this from. Yeah, again, Uh, going to her her ecology. Yes. Uh, So yeah, but in the show, Serena Joy is pretty much the same age as June, and so it becomes more of a direct um, competition. Competition. Mm Another thing that is different, the trackers in the show, uh, the handmaids all have these sort of like ear cuffs like on. Like the things you put on cows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that if they run, they can't get away. This is a lot different than the book where they have tattoos mm-hmm. um, similar to, you know, concentration camps. Right. Yeah, the trackers are, I honestly didn't remember that. So when I rewatched that first episode, she's in a bathtub, like getting ready to go down for the ceremony. And I'm like, what is on her ear? Mm -hmm. Completely forgot that there's this like horrifying modern day system of like GPS location that prevents you from running away from this horrible situation. Oh, you mean like the cell phones that we have on us at all times? I don't want to talk about (laughs) it. (laughs) Sometimes that actually does stop me in my tracks where I'm like, man, it's... (laughs) <laughs> really hope no one could ever oh no I have a cell phone on me all of the time yeah so. which also makes it interesting because they flash back a lot to her escape attempt she and her husband try to get their daughter across the border to Canada like after she's been fired when they like know that the net is is being drawn around them they have a scary escape attempt to Canada that does not go well for them she and her husband well, we don't know what happens to her husband for a while. And she doesn't either. In the book, she has no idea. She has no way of knowing. In the in the show, she kind of imagines him, and then later he does show up, and you find out, like, he made it to Canada somehow, even though she got captured. He's just been eating poutine yeah. and <laughs> riding mooses to work. It's only okay when I say it because I lived there. Mm-hmm. But it's also, I, I mean, a, that scary attempt to get away is really brought home because her daughter is taken away from her and given to another family, like a, an upstanding, righteous commander's family who will raise her right in the faith, right? <clears throat> Which I've seen a parallel between a lot of other times in history, but mm-hmm. specifically in the U.S., um, taking Native American children away from their families and giving them to white families. Yep. Her, her, wi- her commander's wife knows where her daughter is the whole time and uses her as leverage to, like, make... Of Fred do what she wants, which which is just horrifying. It's absolutely not cool, Serena. Not 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 a good look. Just very sad, and uh, obviously families have been torn apart. And but it does a really good job of contrasting uh, that the stuff that's happening in Canada and the. It's basically like the feminist movement or like the civil rights movement of the '60s. There are tons of people picketing. Um, It's again similar to maybe. The, the Native American camps, or even like the Japanese concentration camps that happened in America in, during World War II, when they are trying to get their families back and uh, Gilead will not extradite 
anyone, obviously. So all of these people are constantly at this immigration center in Canada trying to find any news of their their relatives. So, hmm. yeah. It, get, it gets real dark. Um, there are some moments of levity, but not a lot. So just know that going in. It's a, it's a very well done show. Yeah, the cinematographer who worked on the first three episodes to sort of give the show its feel mm-hmm. uh, worked on Beyonce's Lemonade. It has sort of the same moody yeah. atmosphere to it. I, just that those two things in my brain don't Hand go together. Handmaid's and Lemonade. Yeah, are, are very, very different things. An interesting thing that I find in the show as well is it's got a very um, ethnically diverse cast. The book, however, has received some criticism for... There's like one line in there where they say basically everyone who wasn't white was sent away to the colonies. They call them the descendants of Ham. Yes, which is a Noah reference. Yeah, it's one of Noah's sons. Yeah, they're all sent away to the colonies, which are terrible, terrible places to work. It's like where the nuclear power plants have melted down and people are not expected to live very long when they go there. Uh, They're basically sent there to clean up and then die. And a lot of people have criticized The Handmaid's Tale the book for that that sort of like dismissive treatment of all these other people who lived in the area. In the show, they took a different route. Um, but I think the showrunner essentially said that he couldn't imagine recreating that for the show and leaving out actors of color. Right. But I, I feel like the show is probably a little more realistic in that sense of they need people to, to breed basically so badly that that kind of becomes secondary. There's a lot of really important issues at play in both the book and the and the show, probably an important thing to watch and give it a really critical think over. Uh, so wrapping up, do what are some other adaptations of The Handmaid's Tale? Yeah, maybe lesser known than the <laughs> very popular TV show. Lesser known. There was a 1990 film uh, directed by this guy named Volker Schlondorf, which let's just say that again for everyone. Volker Schlondorf. <laughs> It's got uh, Natasha Richardson and Faye Dunaway and Robert Duvall. Wow. Are, yeah, are in this 1990 film. But it's I have not watched it, and I hear that it is not great. Mm. So maybe don't. There's a 2013 audiobook that's narrated by Claire Danes. I know. She'd be great. Yeah. Uh, it won the audio word for fiction. This isn't exactly an adaptation, but a 2019 documentary that you definitely should check out. Oh, sweet. Uh, if you like Peggy at all, it's called Margaret Atwood, A Word After a Word After a Word is Power. Which is a, it's a quote from her. Got it. (laughs) Um, But it's about her life and it does talk a little bit about how she came up with some of the things for The Handmaid's Tale. Talks about her life with Graham Gibson and some of her uh, nature conservancy sort of things that she does. It's really interesting. How she gets her hair so amazing and curly. Oh my gosh, her hair is great. She has great hair. Ugh, beautiful hair. And then we'll get to my favorite one, which is this 2019 graphic novel Mm -hmm. uh, by Renee Nolte. I lo- did you read the graphic novel? Yeah, it's okay. I love it. It's beautiful. I think that if you read it without reading The Handmaid's Tale first, you'd probably be a little bit lost mm. for, for some things. Because there's a lot of like sociopolitical intrigue happening and a lot of uh, really high-level concepts that get boiled down. And not to say that the, the art and stuff isn't great, because it's the watercolor spreads in this book are gorgeous. But some things I feel like get a little bit lost in translation. So I recommend reading the book and then reading the graphic novel. It does kind of inform your understanding in a different way. Hmm. But I feel like it's missing some things as well. Yeah. And sometimes it's got bad punctuation. Uh, and I don't know why. What? <laughs> this is, okay, this is something that really bothers me as okay. a nerd. Uh, some of the things have like commas instead of full stops or uh, colons semicolons so it makes the reading like you don't get the full impact of what's happening yeah because the sentences are just like going on and on and what actually needs to be happening is like short punchy like margaret atwood does in these situations like short punchy action things that show or even like a lot of the times where she's sitting and just like thinking through things to herself they just need to be like individual dialogue boxes or individual thought bubbles and they're Um. all like one big bubble that's my complaint about my one complaint about it. Well, I have one last fun fact thinking about um, her inward dialogue because that's such a huge part of the show. Mm-hmm. In the show, there is a voiceover where Elizabeth Boss 
um, you know, basically tells us what she's thinking. Yeah. And Elizabeth Moss, um, instead of just reading it for the voiceover, she actually memorizes them oh. and then performs them. She's a wonderful actress. She is. Uh, and so I think she was just like, I didn't realize there was any other way to do it. Like, it never occurred to her to just read. <laughs> well, to her, she's right. like, it's not going to be natural if I read it. And then she, well, she also memorizes it so that when she's actually acting it, she is thinking the lines in her head. That makes a lot of sense. Makes a ton of sense. So yeah. Because she has that beautiful facial acting where, like, you mm-hmm. can tell what she's thinking. Yeah. And it makes sense a lot with the book, too, because if you're not a lazy reader <clears throat> and you read the afterward, you know that all of this is being told to you uh, from someone who escaped this and is now, like, using the oral tradition to, like, read back her history to you. Right. So she is just thinking back to things that have happened in her life, which I feel like would be a lot less real if she was just reading them off of a teleprompter. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, lazy readers. I am lazy and I am a reader, but uh, I wouldn't call myself a lazy reader. I would say I'm a lot less lazy now <laughs> because I've been burned so many yeah. times. <laughs> so, definitely a book that I will read over and over and over again in my lifetime. Great, it's amazing. Read value. Mm-hmm. And you should probably read The Testaments as, as a follow-up. I did not like it as much. I forgot we didn't talk about this at all. The Testament focuses more on her daughter that she lost oh um and the daughter that she subsequently had while in gilead and kind of their their experiences as second generation uh gileadians galadians galadians galatians i don't know i would say read the handmaid's tale read the graphic novel Watch the show for sure. If you find out how bad the Robert Duvall film is, I would like to know. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're still interested, read the Testaments as well. Definitely check out Margaret Atwood's body of work. Thanks for listening. This has been The Book Isn't Necessarily Better. And I've been Roxanne. I've been Michaela. Thanks again for listening. So there's only one month of the year where she can do that. You gotta recruit. There's a very small window for recruitment. That enrollment period is stricter than insurance. Yeah. Although most people can agree that now rewatching the Gilmore Girls, that Rory is a monster. A monster who reads a lot. A lot of monsters know how to read. <laughs> okay. One time in college, I had to take a very specific Moby Dick class. I just read Moby Dick twice. And my professor insisted that we read every single word, including like the, the copyright page. I don't know. I like and that. I hated it. <laughs> we are different people. Yep. Yeah. It was the worst class I ever took. <laughs> Okay, yeah. this is totally off topic, but okay. I just think that all Americans who listen to this should know that Canada does, and this is true, has an emergency maple syrup reserve. I Google did it. need to know that. Google it.